present. Maybe? You're looking for the presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, I, I have the to bottom, do. Bottom yeah, right yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So I'm there you do that way too. Okay, here we go. Bingo. So um, the presentation I'm making, I have a wave-based model of a photon. Although I have to go through all sorts of other things in order to get set up to then talk about photons. Oh, let's you know. Uh, as I'm all of a sudden, uh, the people, is it possible that uh, your, your pictures are covering over the edge of my uh, words here? Uh, if you don't, if, if, can you make it so that I don't see you? Uh, yeah, you, now? I think you have to do that. And you just oh, click, uh, you know, you've got four options above the four pictures. You click the, the little, okay, the little okay, one to the okay, left. Okay, okay, I'm going to do that. Uh, oh, or the it. next one along will give you just who's talking. Uh, shoot, I and can't get. I, I I I can't get anything. All I get is chat or pin. I, oh, it's a so you see that you see now you've got you should have four people in a in a row. Top I have the four people. Pictures. Yeah, at the top of that there should be four little icons. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So click to the leftmost one there or minimize it. Okay. Or click second to left, and then you'll we'll only get the speaker. Yeah, I would put the okay. In. Put put yourself in. I think that would be uh, okay. Uh, uh, good uh, good for the video. That and then you can move it as well. But okay, it back. okay. I can't seem to get myself to go. I don't know. That's anyway. right. <laughs> we don't. Mind. Okay. Okay. Now I can see the rest of my chart. Okay, we're ready to go. Uh, so this is a quantum vacuum model I'm starting off with because this is really the basis of even talking about photons. We have to start off with talking about uh, what the quantum vac vacuum is made out of. So is the vacuum an empty void or a universal field capable of generating all fermions, all forces, and all propagating photons? So in thinking about this, you know, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, no, the, it, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And I'm saying we have all sorts of evidence. There's something in the vacuum. For example, the vacuum has the impedance of free space, about 377 ohms. Imagine that the impedance of free space was either zero or infinite. Then you could perhaps argue that it's, there's nothing there. But really, if you say it is a specific uh, uh, impedance here, then there has to be something creating this. And also we have vacuum permittivity. Really, we have a dielectric constant for the vacuum. There's something going on in the vacuum that gives it this dielectric, and also there's magnetic properties that it has. And then it has Planck's constant in, inside the vacuum. In other words, every place in the universe, you have really the speed of light, the gravitational constant, and Planck's constant being enforced. So these things are really so, uh, it's so baked into our perception of the universe that we don't say that there has to be something causing this. It's almost like these are laws of nature that are imposed from on high, and we don't, And but really I'm saying, no, there has to be a reason why this is going, why this is here. And I'm saying the reason is the vacuum has a vacuum content. So now another problem we have is the observable energy of the universe is about 10 to the minus nine joules per cubic meter. Now this obviously is not evenly distributed. This is averaging in all of the black holes and stars and dark matter and that sort of thing. Uh, so QED uh, assumes that the quantum vacuum has an enormous energy density. This is required in order for them to get the extremely accurate calculation of the anomalous magnetic moment of an electron and also the electron's lamp shift. So there is one branch of physics that says, oh, yes, we, we assume that the, we have a large energy density of the vacuum and we use this in the calculations. So now we have this state, this problem stated as the cosmological constant problem. Either there's 10 to the 113th joules per cubic meter, or there's 10 to the minus 9 joules per cubic meter. Well, 
I'm going to go with John Archibald Wheeler, who in 1955 proposed that the vacuum is a continuously fluctuating quantum vacuum. And he said, no point is more central than this. Empty space is not empty. It is the seat of the most violent physics. The geometry of space is subject to quantum fluctuations of the order of Planck length. And uh, by the way, uh, as I was looking at, uh, and it was, I guess I can't see it here, but he on that blackboard, he's got various things that he happened to be talking about this exact thing. Uh, you, the Bible of, of general relativity is this book by uh, called Gravitation. And in the last chapter, they talk about not just the general relativity, but they talk about essentially the properties that have to exist to make it happen. So that book contains the, uh, the, the words, the density of field fluctuation energy in the vacuum, approximately 10 to the 113th joules per cubic meter. They use uh, something per square cent cubic centimeter, but I changed it. Argues that elementary particles represent a percentage-wise, almost completely negligible change in the locally violent conditions that characterize the vacuum. So... The basic assumption that I have is that the quantum vacuum is a sea of Planck length vacuum oscillations at Planck frequency. Now, I have slightly changed this from the exact wording of Wheeler. In other words, he had all frequencies up to Planck frequency. And I'm saying, no, the real way is that it's fundamentally at Planck frequency. And the way you get all the lower frequencies is if you average over a volume of space then you have many of these fluctuating oscillations going on, and then there is a slight variation among that, so you get lower frequency and uh, low, different conditions that you would need to really make vacuum zero, zero point energy and the uncertainty principle. So to achieve vacuum, uh, vacuum energy and the uncertainty principle, we need to have this, type, this assumption. Sorry, can so, I ask a very quick question? Yes. About, just to clarify exactly what you meant there. So that you said the Planck frequency um, is 10 to the 43. And that's for every Planck thing, or, uh, Planck uh, item. Yes. Um, and that frequency you are assuming is always exact, pretty much exactly that. And But then within a volume, you're saying you may get some other completely different frequency. So... so yeah. It averages is it the frequencies of the things that add or is it the amplitude across that volume that is differing that gives you the impression of a different frequency so um put it put this way i i, I haven't gone back and worked out exactly what is required mm -hmm. but let's suppose that you had a volume that is the size of i don't know a proton yeah. And um, you then say, okay, within that volume, there is mm -hmm. still a Planck length fluctuation going on when you've averaged over everything that's present in that. Yeah. And it is now not at Planck frequency. That particular volume seems to have an oscillation of the characteristics you'd expect for speed of light communication within that volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a lower frequency. No, a lower yeah. frequency, yes. So, Everything's lower. Yeah. So, so the requirement for zero point energy is that you have essentially um, all all frequencies, uh, and I'm saying that the way I reconcile that is I'm saying that the model is that it's Planck frequency, but all the lower frequencies are made up by additions of these oscillating fluctuations. Can okay, I great. say something just yes. quickly? Um, so I'm a computer scientist. And so I see Planck frequency analogous to not exactly the same as the clock frequency of a computer. So yes. the clock frequency of the computer is the, you know, the rate at which everything, the whole universe is running, but a proton runs at about 10 to the 23 and the electron mm -hmm. runs at around 10 to the 20. Right. Yeah. And so yes. it's just an analogy, but I think it's a kind of an interesting mm. way of thinking about it. That's great. OK, uh, yes. Good. And Thanks. the interesting thing about this is that in this model, then 
the oscillations are going at the speed of light. In other words, Planck, by the way, I'm using capital L for Planck length because it's also a wave property and also just it looks better. So <laughs> Planck length times Planck angular frequency equals the speed of light. So the same way as the speed of sound and air is determined by the velocity of the molecules, the thermal velocity, and you can actually conceptually understand why sound goes through air at that speed. I'm saying we can now understand why waves propagate at the speed of light. This isn't just some externally imposed law. This is the physics of the vacuum that determines that speed. Mm -hmm. So then I've taken my video here and I'm trying to uh, simulate these fluctuations. So this is meant to, each of these peaks is meant to uh, represent, say, an expansion of space, and the depression is a contraction of space. But also, uh, while I'm going to be mainly talking about the spatial properties, there's also a time effect going on, whereas if you could have a clock running at, you know, at in one of these peaks, it would be going a little bit faster than a clock running at the other end. So, so this is both a spatial and a temporal uh, fluctuation. So this is a quantifiable medium with the following acoustic properties. So I'm not doing, I'm not going through any calculations in this presentation, but in other papers and in this book that I've written, uh, you know, it's easy to calculate the speed of light from this, but also if you calculate the impedance of this medium, in other words, it's possible to take the, um, anyway, I, I won't even go into the calculation, but you finally get to an impedance uh, that is implied by this Planck length at Planck frequency. And there's two ways of expressing it. What I'm calling the strain impedance, which is the slope of a sine wave, the maximum slope, turns out to be C cubed over G, this is an enormous number, 10 to the 35th kilogram seconds, kilograms per second. Um, and the interesting thing is that this enormous impedance is what makes it possible for this one medium to make everything in the universe. In other words, we have to have a medium that can have, you know, Planck length, waves that have an amplitude of Planck length that can create electrons, that can create photons, that can create everything. And you get everything out of this enormous impedance. There's really two ways of expressing this impedance. The second way is the displacement impedance. Uh, rather than being a dimensionless slope that goes with this impedance, this says if you have Planck length or a length as your amplitude term, then the impedance looks like C cubed over G divided by lambda bar squared. I'm using lambda bar all the time, and it's the same as lambda divided by two pi. And then there's a bulk modulus, which also is corresponding to the, what would you might call the energy density of the medium. But it turns out that this medium doesn't have a single energy density or a single bulk modulus. It depends on the wavelength that you're pro you're probing it with. So the, you get a wavelength squared term in there. For example, um, the uh, with the impedance of a uh, inductor is not a single impedance. It depends on the frequency they put in here. So these things have that type of a, a wavelength or frequency dependence also. Um, this is a nonlinear acoustic medium. In other words, we have a maximum frequency, which is either Planck angular frequency, and a, and a, which is a Planck angular frequency, or a minimum wavelength, which is Planck length. So these are boundaries. If we had an infinite, uh, no limits, then we wouldn't have any boundaries and we wouldn't have any nonlinearity in this medium. But the, the moment we put these boundaries on, then we find that there is uh, nonlinears are created. And this boundary means that waves in the universal field have a linear component that ultimately is responsible for electromagnetic properties and a nonlinear component that produces gravity. So the assumption is the universal field is a quantum mechanical acoustic medium. It turns out that um, 
when you use the word acoustic medium, I don't know if I buy psychological, it's almost like, oh, that's ordinary. That's not sophisticated like quantum mechanics. That's so simple. But it turns out that once you think of the quantum vacuum as an acoustic medium, everything gets simple. So we're going to go and we're going to adopt this. So we, we're going to have some terms here. Uh, the displacement amplitude of everything in the universe, it turns out to all have the same displacement amplitude of Planck length. And uh, so anyway, then we have the, I'm just using these other terms of uh, Planck frequency for the fluctuation frequency. So the impedance encountered by gravitational waves. So, so far I'm saying just from purely the idea that we have the uh, vacuum fluctuations, Planck length at Planck frequency, we've got this C cubed over G, but the amazing thing- Sorry, John, just very quick, that last slide, I saw the first one, but I didn't see the second two. You, uh... Go back, you mean? Yes, yeah, sorry. So the first one is, are you saying the amplitude of all waves in this model is Planck length? All, uh, yes, all quantized waves. In other words, if with when we get to photons, we can have many photons, add together to make a distortion a, a mod, an amplitude bigger than Planck length. But oh, okay. a single a single photon has Planck length okay. amplitude. And I'll get to that. Oh, great. Oh, well, that's very simple. Everything, it, by the way, <laughs> I'm just going to mention here, you know, when you have energy equals H bar omega, People can look at that and they can say, well, wait a minute, the amplitude, it can't be a wave because where is the amplitude? You know, if you look at a water wave, a big mm. amplitude has a different energy than a small mm. amplitude. I don't see an amplitude term in there. But it turns out that since all photons have the same fundamental amplitude, they have different frequencies, but the displacement, the, uh, the height of the wave is Planck length. And it turns out that when you put that in the equation, everything cancels and you don't have an amplitude term, you're left with a, an H-bar term that is the remnants of what was an amplitude. Mm -hmm. Sounds nice. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks. So anyway, uh, so I'm now, I'm saying that uh, people that are, it's, gravitational waves encounter this C cubed over G and uh, there's really a couple books by uh, their books on gravitational waves. And this fellow Blair from Australia, um, he was the first one to determine that a gravitational waves also encounter this impedance. So he didn't actually show how he got to this, but I get to it quite easily. In other words, there's a very simple formula for the intensity of a wave. It doesn't have e to the i omega t, it has the intensity is equals a constant, a uh, numerical constant times the amplitude squared, the frequency squared, and the impedance. So then when you take the uh, intensity of a weak gravitational wave and rearrange the, comp uh, the terms so that you have this, and this is an amplitude uh, that they measure with, with an uh, interferometer, this is the frequency of the gravitational wave, and this turns out to be the impedance that they have. So here we have confirmation that this is the impedance of space-time. So the bulk, bulk modulus of a quantum vacuum, um, so I'm just going to go over this quickly. The bulk modulus of anything is to change the pressure and it gets a change in volume. And uh, so it, anyway, it, it, it encounters this bulk modulus. That's not too important though. Um, so it turns out then that what we're saying is that from general relativity, we get support for this impedance and space time therefore has to be viewed as a very el stiff elastic medium that can propagate waves. Does this vacuum really have energy density? Well, it depends on how you define energy. First of all, you got to know it doesn't have energy density. If you define energy as this typical energy definition from relativity, however, it does have energy if you use one of my equations that is involving wave amplitude, frequency, impedance, volume, and the speed of light. 
And it turns out that the difference between these two is that energy in this form has to have spin or quantized angular momentum. And energy in this form doesn't have quantized angular momentum. In fact, it is the medium, it is the field. It, you know, we always hear, oh yes, we have all these fields and then we have to put an excitation into the field in order to get a particle or something. Well, the excitation is this quantized angular momentum. It has to have some energy associated with it. But anyway, this is the, um, the key to being able to rationalize how these two energies can exist. So the space-time field is a perfect superfluid. Um, so first of all, the cosmic microwave phot background photons lose energy with uh, the cosmic expansion. And the reason I bring this up is that you can see from the time of the Big Bang on, the, there has been a tremendous change in the energy of a single cosmic microwave background photon. And yet it has exactly the same angular momentum as it had at the beginning of the Big Bang. So that the lost energy uh, becomes part of the space-time field. And the space-time field has no angular momentum. It's a superfluid. And I'm going to talk about superfluids for a moment. So a Bose-Einstein condensate is the most perfect of the superfluids. There's also liquid helium and that sort of thing. But it turns out that uh, they've been able to uh, take photographs of the, um, if you add angular momentum to the Bose-Einstein condensate, it, a whole condensate doesn't start to rotate. You get these little tiny vortices that rotate and they make a depression in the surface and they're able to photograph this. And this, this is a computer simulation of what they're seeing here. But one of the things that uh, has recently been found, I don't know if recently, but anyway, that besides these vortices that have depend on a surface and, and uh, there's also rotating um, volumes inside this that they call rotons, and both of these have a h bar of angular momentum. So these are perfect analogies for what I'm going to say the uh, particles are. In, in other words, an electron is is in a rotating vo um, volume of space that has a, that has Planck length distortion and it has a rotation frequency and so forth that I've been I've discussed in other other places. So the space-time based model of the universe resolves the 10 to the 120 power difference. And so you have the observable energy density of the universe is 10 to the minus nine joules per cubic meter. And the vacuum energy density is they're saying 10 to the minus 10 to the 113 joules per cubic meter. And, um, but this one doesn't have a uh, spin. And uh, so now I'm going to move on to the properties of the waves in the universal field. So there's several equations. They're very simple equations, but they have worked wonders for being able to understand all sorts of things about this. They start off with the intensity of a wave, a numerical cons. Oops, I got to go back. Uh, amplitude squared frequency squared times impedance. Well, now we can change this in, this equation into an energy density equation if we add into there, if we uh, divide this by the speed of light, then we get energy density. Then to get energy, we have to add in volume and uh, the speed of light. And then to get a force, we have to distribute this wave over an area. So when I get the forces of gravity and the forces of uh, electrostatic forces and so forth, I'm using this equation, for example, and I'm using the impedance, I'm using the frequency, I'm using the amplitude and so forth. So first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, gravitational waves and you have an amplitude term and these are different polarizations that add up to a specific amplitude the displacement. In a gravitational wave, when you're using an interferometer, you are using the change of length. The, where, where's my little pointer here? 
Okay, you have the change of length, which is the round trip on the gravitation on the interferometer divided by the round trip length of the interferometer. So the it, when they make this measurement, they're really using an approximation because, for example, they're depending on the fact that the round trip length of the interferometer is much smaller than the gravitational wave itself. If you ever had a gravitational wave that was the same wavelength as the round trip length of the interferometer, everything cancels and you'd find out you got no effect at all. So you need the gravitational wave to be at least 10 times bigger to get a fairly accurate point. So anyway, here's, uh, so it, maybe I'm gonna go on to the next, uh, the, I'm gonna go back to this slide in a different form in a minute. Um, so gravitational waves propagate in the space-time field and revealed its properties. So the revealed that the intensity, the uh, impedance is this. And all fermions and photons have the same displacement amplitude, Planck length. This came, I didn't, I didn't decide I was going to make that it this way. It turned out that was what came out of the analysis. Once I began to analyze the wave properties, then I was surprised to discover that everything turned out to be Planck length. Therefore, it is easy to calculate the energy of this model. Uh, this model predicts for both photons and fermions. There are two ways of expressing wave amplitude, either as uh, displacement amplitude and strain amplitude. Strain amplitude is the maximum slope. So now I can get to something I really wanna talk about, which is that when we're dealing with the waves in space-time, really we have an amplitude that goes from plus Planck length to minus Planck length. You had that video that I had those little bobbling, uh, those waves in the elastic uh, medium there. So this is the amplitude in a spatial amplitude. And the important part is that the maximum slope here is really the maximum amplitude divided by the angular wavelength. So here we have the spatial amplitude being this, this here, and this enters into all sorts of things. It's going to enter into the energy calculations of electrons. It's going to enter, enter into photons and everything else. It turns out there's also a temporal property where the amplitude goes from plus Planck time to minus Planck time. In other words, imagine clocks are speeding up and slowing down by Planck time. And again, the slope, the slope then is one over the uh, Compton frequency. Well, I, this is the Compton frequency of, of, say, an electron. Photons also propagate in this medium. In the maximum confinement, photons have a strain amplitude of Planck length divided by the angular wavelength of the photon. Now, I'm talking about confi maximum confinement. Imagine for analysis, I want to say, okay, I can have photons all different sizes. I want to get it down to the smallest possible size. What's the smallest size? Well, a waveguide for circularly polarized light, if you have a waveguide that is a slight amount more than half a wavelength in diameter, that's the minimum size that a photon can go through. And then if you have end mirrors on this that are separated by half a wavelength, that's the minimum separation. So you can fit a photon into that size um, uh, volume, but it's not evenly distributed. It's, it's more concentrated in the center and the magnetic fields are different than the electric fields and all this sort of thing. So anyway, I am able to just say, okay, I'm going to then just say the, the uh, for simplicity, the volume is the, uh, angular wavelength cubed, and that's the approximate average over everything. Maybe there's a numerical constant that needs to be changed, but that's uh, that's a small concern later. Um, therefore, the energy of the photon can be calculating knowing the strain amplitude and angular frequency. Um, photons also propagate in this medium besides, besides the uh, models of an electron. In max, okay, I've already gone through this, but now I'm going to talk about the equation that determines the photon's energy. 
So here we have energy, and this is one of these equations I talked about, amplitude, frequency, impedance, the volume that the photon is distributed over and divided by C. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to take and I'm going to substitute in here this, this amplitude, which is the dimensionless strain amplitude, uh, where this is the wavelength of the photon, the angular wavelength, the frequency of the photon, the C cubed over G, and now we have the volume that I've confined it to. So I'm saying the, the, use, the volume I'm using is lambda bar cubed, and then this C comes from here. And if this lambda bar cubed isn't exactly right, well, I got this fudge factor, this numerical constant. But when, when you mathematically work this out, it all equals this numeric constant, H bar or omega. So in other words, all of these other things, the amplitude, the, the the idea that there was uh, an amplitude term and everything, they all cancel out. We're just left with this. So here I am able to calculate the, the simplest equation that has anything to do with a photon's energy from the properties of this, uh, this wave model of a photon. So is this uh, basically saying the energy of a photon is just related to its frequency and some constant. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, the, the Planck's, uh, so yeah, Planck's constant times the free, it turns out that this gives you the exact photon energy and this K is one, uh, well, you know, I but I, did, I didn't really know that when I was calculating. Okay. I just, so, I just saying that I, I acknowledge. That's amazing. Planck I, constants. So if someone said how much energy in a photon, I could just say, well, it's the frequency times Planck constant. Oh, that's no, it. yeah. Yes, no, that's absolute. If you work nice. with lasers, that's kind of like first day, you have to know that, okay? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, so uh, since all photons have the same amplitude, there is no amplitude term in this equation. So now I'm going to give a brief overview of electrons in order to be able to set up what I'm going to be able to have to talk about for the uh, photons. So it, when I started all, I, first of all, I'm an inventor, and there was a day that I discovered that if I had light in a box and I can find this light and I say, okay, this light has a certain amount of energy and therefore it has a certain amount of implied mass. It turned out that I said, oh, let's see, just looking at light, it has, the confined light has, if I accelerated that box, that confined light exerts more pressure on the back wall than the front wall, and it exhibits inertia. And from that, I began to say, how many other properties does it have? Well, it turned out that it has the relativistic kinetic energy that the mass should have. It has the weight in a gravitational field. It has the correct momentum. It has the correct de Broglie wavelength, the correct de Broglie phase velocity, that's faster than the speed of light, by the way. It has the correct relativistic length contraction, the correct time dilation. Well, I'm looking at this and I'm saying to myself, I have seen other people struggling with trying to come up with a model of an electron and they come up with one point. Oh yes, if we combine this and this, we get an electric field. They don't, no, 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 they don't get the, all these other things. If I just say I'm going to deal with the wave properties, all of a sudden, if I can make a, a model that incorporates the equivalent of light in a box, I pick up all of these properties just by making a wave that has this finite volume. So then the first thing I went and, and analyzed was well, when I was really coming up with this, I was really analyzing a laser where you have two mirrors and you have standing waves in between here. But in this particular case, I'm analyzing a moving laser and I'm pretending that I can actually see the waves. Well, it turns out in that other, the other videos that you've seen, this is moving, this is the wave pattern you'd get if it's moving at 5% the speed of light. It has a modulation envelope that turns out to be the de Broglie wavelength. And it has a relativistic contraction Mathematically, that, that was in the paper I have, and there's a more rigorous analysis. Also, there's an a energetic, the wavelength decrease corresponds to an energy increase. 
which is a relative state. It's kinetic energy in the low velocities, or it, it's always kinetic energies, but it's one half mv squared at low velocities and the relativistic corrections. So all of these wonderful things happen if you have light in a box. So to achieve a, a electron's de Broglie wavelength properties, the light must have the following. An electron's Compton frequency, so this uh, approximately 10 to the 21st first radians per second. So I didn't decide I was going to have the model be Compton frequency. What it said was that in order to get the de Broglie wave characteristics, this is, I have to have this frequency. And it also has to be a rotating spherical standing waves. And the video that you've seen shown that they make linear uh, interference standing waves inside those that are uh, de Broglie characteristics. Um, so uh, then, and these rotating standing waves must extend indefinitely from the electron core. In other words, if you have two slit, if you have the electron going through a double slit experiment, the slits are far, much further apart than any radius term I might have for an electron. And so they extend on out and really they associated with the electric field also. Um, this wave-based model achieves uh, an electron's electrostatic force and gravitational force. I didn't go through all of the other equations and this, this is contained in here, but I'm saying that when I, I analyze this, it generates the, uh, for example, it implies that the electron has a gravitational radius and it's this uh, Planck length squared divided by the electron's Compton wavelength. And it turns out to be this number. Now this is, I think this is the most important equation of all, because on one side we have this is rel general relativity, uh, and this is pure quantum mechanics, and we get the and I go through in the papers all the different things that this quantum radio uh, this electron gravitational radius achieves. Um, it also uh, I gets the force force ratio, and here again we have this amplitude, this uh, term squared times Planck force times. Uh, alpha to the minus one. So there is more equations, but I didn't add anything more. Now I'm moving on to photons. Model also uh, quantifies the distortion of space produced by an electric field. So this is something that is in some of my papers, but the earlier ones. And I'm able, when I was looking at the, um, you know, the, the Planck properties of space time, in other words, we have Planck length and Planck force. And, and, and anyway, when you take equations, if you get rid of all of the, if you set uh, C and G and H bar equal to one, you're gonna get Planck properties. But an analysis of that generates the idea that you should be able to, that you get what I'm calling a charge conversion constant. And this is Planck charge. Planck charge is about 11.7 times larger charge than charge E. And if we take this ratio of Planck length divided by Planck charge, we get this. And this turns out to be roughly 10 to the minus, uh, anyway, this meters per cubic, uh, meters per cubic Coulomb. So this charge conversion constant allows you to get rid of Coulombs, which are, are counterintuitive in my mind, and convert them to touchy-feely units of length. So we're gonna test this uh, Planck conversion constant. This is only a few tests. So first of all, we're going to use this uh, Planck length divided by Planck charge um, and look at the Coulomb force constant. You know, in the Coulomb law, you have, e, uh, you know, I have the charge divided by one over four pi epsilon sub zero R squared. So I'm gonna change this using this constant into what does this turn out to be? Well, it turns out that the conversion turns out to yield Planck force, which is C to the fourth over G. Well, that totally makes plant sense. Planck Coulomb force constant, the biggest, the, the really the standard force constant in the universe is Planck force. So these two are connected by this. So, um, 
so this distortion of the universal field, when I get to uh, analyzing single photons, then I find out that it produces this Planck length distortion. And also, if I say I have many photons, uh, then you turn out that the distortion that it produces is n, if I have n photons, then it's the square root of n times Planck length, that's the length. Well, if you can imagine me sitting at a table thinking about this, one day it occurred to me, I said, wait a minute, this is wrong, this has got to be wrong, because it implies that there is a limit to how intense an electric uh, a focus electron uh, focus laser beam could be. Let's suppose that I have a laser and I can focus it to the smallest size, roughly a wavelength and diameter. And I can just take that power knob and start cranking up the intensity of this. And I start to begin to distort the distance across this. And finally, I should reach a point where I have distorted it by 100%. So at that point, I'm going to go back here. At that point, I'm saying to myself, that can't possibly be. So uh, I'm going to skip this uh, and then go on to the, uh, oh boy, here, hold on. I'm, <laughs> I was going someplace that I've not. Uh, So, uh, okay, I'm going to go in a different way. Anyway, I'll get back to this thing about focusing the laser beam. I'm going to move on to the most important. Do, do you mind if I laser. just interrupt yes. real quickly, John? Um, if we're going to go back to last one then, and you did a uh, Coulomb's, you know, kind of kind of conversion. So, in in the end, is the is the key takeaway here that you know Coulomb is really a, a length. Yeah, and it's not just an ordinary length. It's yeah. what I'm calling polarized length. In yeah. other words, uh, if I have a ruler, uh, it, I can orient it in any direction and it works. If I'm dealing mm -hmm. with the length that's uh, going away from the electron, I there's a difference between the radial direction and the circumferential direction. Yeah, so, yeah. But, um, but the only reason I, I bring that up uh, because Lori's on the line. Lori, Lori, Lori knows this one, you know, very well. That um, yeah, yeah. I had a big smile, to smile on my face meters. when you said that. So, yeah. Yeah. Say Coulomb that again. Units of meters um, in, in a lot of the equations, you know, it's very, very simple. You replace coulombs with, with meters, distance, and yeah. uh, you'll find a lot of the electrical equations map perfectly to, uh, to mechanical equations. Oh, amazing. Yeah, it, it's just yeah. That, that coulombs unit has held up that that kind of correlation for so many years. And and actually, uh, even Steve you know, brought this up the other day when we we're talking about some of the uh, Planck um, derivations, too. It's it's a really simple switch, but so many equations just start to come together once once you do that switch. So this is this is how many coulombs <laughs> make how much length. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, I was going in a different direction here. The most important part when I was going through these conversions, in fact, I'm sitting there and, and again, you know, I'm, I'm going through all sorts of conversions. Oh, it's like uh, taking out a new car for a test drive. Oh, let's, let's apply this this way and this way. And finally I said, let's, let's go and look at the impedance of free space. So the impedance of free space is 377 ohms. And I'm now going, this is, I, I'm using this, uh, I, I really think, I've now converted over to just, rather than using this ETA symbol, I'm using this. But anyway, I then convert this, or I need to square it in order to get rid of the Coulombs. And so here's what I do. The, this impedance of free space is the same as epsilon sub zero divided by C. And then the square of this is this term here. So when I multiply it out, it turns out to be four pi times C cubed over G, which is four pi times the, uh, the strain of this impedance of uh, free space, uh, impedance of space time. So uh, it, it turns out that what this says is that light and gravitational waves propagate in the same medium. And uh, in other words, the impedance that light encounters is the same as the impedance that the gravitational waves encounter. This four, four pi doesn't count. And in fact, Planck impedance gets rid of that four pi. So I'm getting back to this other thing. I'm saying the prediction that I was hit with was that it should be impossible to exceed 
uh, if Planck length times the number of photons in this focus is uh, going to, it, it can't exceed the wavelength of the focus. And I thought to myself, this is impossible and it must mean that I'm wrong. So then when I quickly worked out the, uh, the this equation, uh, so I said, how many photons were required to do this? And uh, it turns out that the number of photons that you reach this condition, that this is the impossible condition that the light can't be transmitted anymore. It turns out to generate the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. Now, I got to say, <laughs> it was a jaw dropping type of moment. And it, it's kind of like it totally makes sense. If you kept cranking up that um, that intensity or the light and power, and you'd finally hit a point where no more light would go through that because you had reached this limit of what space time can transmit. So rather than this being some Achilles heel, it turns out to be a confirmation of this model. So I'm going uh, I'm going to also now talk about something that's really important concerning the concept of photons. And Everybody talks about uh, the photon's energy as being quantized. Well, when you think about it, energy, yes, when a photon is absorbed, 100% of the energy gets transferred to the medium. But really, energy doesn't come in discrete units. In other words, let's suppose the energy was what I'm calling truly quantized into discrete units of a half an electron volt or a tenth of an electron volt. Then you would have discrete steps in energy. Uh, but now we know that even the same photon, depending on what frame of reference you're in, you're going to get different amounts of energy you measure as you look at that photon. However, angular momentum is strongly quantized because it comes only in integers multiples of half h-bar. In fact, the transfer of angular momentum only comes in integer multiples of h-bar. Uh, so, uh, so a photon, photon quantized is quantized because angular momentum is quantized. So I'm going to, I'm going to say a key component in understanding the model of the photon. And really when we get onto pot, uh, polarization, the key component is that everything is based on the idea that angular momentum is the key ingredient that determines the property, the quantized angular momentum is the key component that determines the property of the, uh, the photon. And I'm going to start off by talking about a carbon monoxide molecule. Here is a diatomic molecule with a se charge separation. So it's a nice part, molecule to work with. And uh, the uh, molecule possesses quantized angular momentum. The Carbon and oxygen nuclei are separated by about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And the in its lowest energy form, in its zero point energy form, it is always rotating. It is rotating at about 57 gigahertz. And if we do an energy graph, this is this zero point here is half h nu, we'd really half h bar worth of energy. And then the first energy level that you can actually, you know, the carbon monoxide will rotate at different frequencies, but they all are separated by about 115 gigahertz, which amounts to adding h-bar worth of angular momentum. So now we have an example of not, we, we can argue about what, whether an electron really is physically spinning or not, but there's no argument about whether a carbon monoxide molecule is really spinning. We can really see this. And in lasers, these energy level, rotational energy levels are very important. So the rotational properties of a seal of a carbon monoxide molecule, and I, I already said this about 57 gigahertz. And uh, so I'm saying, what enforces this? Why is it not possible to have an intermediate rotation? All quantization is the result of quantized angular momentum. Ang angular momentum com comes in units of h-bar. Well, I wrote this, I'd say half h-bar or h-bar if you're transferring in an angular momentum. Energy appears to be quantized, but this quantization is the result of the transfer of h-bar angular momentum. 
Planck's constant is incorporated in Planck length and Planck frequency oscillations of the universal field. So we have the universal field. And if you look at the equation for Planck length, h bar g over c cubed and that to the one half power. So it incorporates h bar. So every part of the vacuum incorporates h bar and it's, it's, it's enforcing this uh, angular momentum limitation. Therefore, the universe imposes quantized angular momentum. The photon's angular momentum greatly exceeds the linear momentum. By the way, what I'm going to tell you now is something that I just discovered in pre pre preparing this briefing. I actually wrote about this in a book 10 years ago or eight years ago, and I forgot about it. And it came back, and I now understand it better than ever. So. I'm going to take the carbon monoxide molecule again, and I'm going to say the carbon and oxygen nuclei of a CO molecule are separated by 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. When the CO molecule increases its rotation rate by 115 gigahertz, the carbon and oxygen nuclei physically increase the rotation speed by about 39 meters per second. If you take this um, diameter and 115 gigahertz and say, how fast is the circumference moving? It's moving about this. Now there's a slight difference since the carbon and oxygen molecule are different weights, and, but I, I treated them as if they were the same. Maybe a nitrogen molecule is spinning at this rate. So the momentum transfer from 115 gigahertz photon imparts a translational velocity of this number, five times 10 to minus six meters per second. In other words, if it absorbs that photon, it gets a little nudge, moves very slowly. However, it turns out that I'm saying, wait a minute, look at this tremendous disconnect. In other words, when it absorbs the photon, the molecules start rotating and increase their speed by 39 meters a second, but the photon, the translational energy uh, momentum that was imparted to this was this infinitesimal amount here. And therefore the angular momentum transfer exceeds the translational momentum by a factor of 80,000. Let's suppose that we could allow those carbon and oxygen nuclei to come apart. We just break the bond They'd go flying off in opposite directions at 39 meters a second. So, in other words, this is this is real, ang this is real momentum that has been transferred to these molecules or to these atoms, and it is impossible to come up with a model where you do this by shooting balls, <laughs> uh, photon, uh, virtual photons at this. You have to have the a connection between all of space-time being part of this and really the wave collapsing on this on a spherical sort of a way to you know to impart this type of change in angular change in, in uh, really angular momentum. So this is a, another proof about how this model has to be these waves in this medium and so forth. In other words, I'm not sure anybody has ever really looked at this before. Uh, all quantization is the result of quantized angular momentum. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, maybe skip this. Um, the photon's angular momentum greatly exceeds the linear momentum. Uh, I, I've already talked about that. <laughs> this is the problem of putting together a briefing in a short time. Rotating dipole uh, emits circularly polarized light. Oh, okay. So I'm going to talk about, I'm, let's suppose that we are going to try and understand the emission of electromagnetic radiation. So usually we talk about a vibrating dipole, the plus and minus that's vibrating, but the much more intuitive one, if you have a rotating dipole, or you have physically, uh, let's suppose that we have two spherical uh, two spheres, one negatively charged and one positively charged, and there's some sort of a connection between them. And we now physically start rotating them. Now we look at the emission that comes from that. And there used to be some websites that showed this beautifully, and now they, they've disappeared. But anyway, what happens is that from the poles, you get 
circularly polarized light. If you look, if you if you uh, are looking at this from down from the North Pole, you only intercept circularly polarized light. And if you look at it from say someplace halfway between the pole and the equator, you get elliptically polarized light. But from the equator, it's only emitting linearly polarized light. So one of the problems I always had is, wait a minute, how can linearly polarized light carry angular momentum? Well, let's just do a thought experiment. We have this rotating charge, two spheres charged, and we, all, we have put two hemispherical reflectors over there with a little gap. So we only let out the linearly polarized photons that are being emitted from the equator. So each time a linearly polarized photon comes out of that volume, it has to be slowing down the rotation of the, of the uh, rotating charges. So it is carrying away a specific amount of uh, angular, a specific rotation direction of angular momentum and so linearly polarized light appears to be not carrying angular momentum when you have a whole lot of photons. But when you get down to the individual photons, there has to be uh, a specific uh, rotation direction. I've actually come up with an experiment that would confirm this, uh, but that's uh, another story. <laughs> Hey, hey, John. Um, yes. Sorry if you don't mind me interrupting again. I, I do have to you drop have to go. right now, but right. I really do appreciate it. It's been uh, fascinating. And, and okay. Well, since, since the video is being recorded, and I think yeah. also. Oh, that's I'll, right. That's right. I'll be able to go back and. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll, perfect. I'm going to I'm gonna, uh, also put it on the same website that had that other video that you saw. So uh, okay. you can see. Uh, unfortunately, I thought I'd pace myself, but I guess not. I did. I felt quite relaxed. But I, I will follow the rest of the uh, the video once it's. Posted. OK. OK, okay. good. All right. Bye, John. Thank see you. you. Goodbye. Bye. See you, Jeff. Bye. So now we get it. <laughs> now we get into the good part of the, the structure here. So how is it possible for a linearly polarized photon to carry angular momentum, not just any angular momentum, or not, but a specific rotation direction angular momentum? So I so used- John, uh, I, I used, just briefly interrupt yes. and ask a question? Um, yes. So polarization, is that basically, I know you've got filters for polarization, meaning it can get yeah, through. Yeah. Is it basically in this model that you're using a direction of vibration. So basically, uh, if a bit of space is vibrating like that, as it as the wave travels, yes, and it's polarized that way. Yes, if it's, do it's that way or yes. that way. Is that and all it is? And then circular is going around in a circle, one rotation every way. How does every... that? How how do you visualize? Like, if I don't know anything about polarization, okay. and I've got to visualize a circular rotating. So so first of, of all, got, yeah, yeah. First of all, imagine an electric field rotating. So that's, you don't have to, you can just have the whole electric field whole rotating. Thing. Okay. It, it, it's distributed and it's just going around. So there you don't necessarily need any motion. But now when we get down to the nitty gritty of the uh, fact that uh, the electric field is in fact, it changes to a length effect. There is in fact a slight, you know, getting down to, in fact, when you're getting, it, when I got Planck length, I was saying that was when I was in maximum confinement. When you get down to the electric field that is, uh, you know, a photon is distributed over a large volume. So we've distributed that Planck length effect over. So the, anyway, they're smaller. You can, by the way, one thing, one concept is you can't have a wave that is any shorter wavelength than Planck length, but you can have an amplitude that is smaller than Planck length. Yeah. So uh, there's no no problem there. So anyway, part of the question is going to be answered by what I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So imagine for a moment that this was made for for an electron, but I'm going to imagine for a moment that we have a plus charge and a minus charge, and we're looking down. And these are rotating, and we've now cross sectioned this at the equator. So here we have, you might say, the effect of the minus charge, and here we have the effect of the plus charge. Well, these are Archimedean spirals. And the Archimedean spiral is different than, uh, than concentric circles. 
In other words, the Archimedean spiral, if we draw a perpendicular to the spiral, it turns out when we go back, if, we, if it was a concentric circle, we'd draw a perpendicular to that, we go back to the center of the center, and these are all concentric. When we do it with an Archimedean spiral, we come back to this uh, circle that is uh, one Compton, uh, for, a, for an electron, it's Compton angular wavelength in radius. And um, so these, so a wave that has a wavefront that is tipped, it's propagating, it's propagating in a, in a direction that is as if it is coming from the center of this circle, but its wavefront is not is off, it's at an angle. So it is carrying angular momentum in its wavefront. And in fact, I've uh, come up with, uh, you know, okay. Uh, I, I, anyway, I came so up I with- I see what you mean now. You mean, I, so basically it's the, if, if that wave hits something, it's not straight on from yes. the particle it's from the left of the particle it so, looks like that line. so so but but the, you the haven't gotten you, you you now have to you're asking a good question i should have actually gone into this detail so when it hits something mm. we now have to transfer this h bar worth of angular momentum and i'm going to get on in a little while to talk of, talk about the um entanglement and mm -hmm. entanglement is a concept that everybody says oh yeah we can't understand it but when we get to waves it, it is understandable but mm -hmm. the pre the same thing that gives two photons the entanglement property a single photon is able to command all its wave properties in a way that allows it to collapse the same way as the entanglement properties can collapse so I'm saying that when you absorb a photon, mm -hmm. the, the waves that are distributed over a large volume, all of a sudden are called in and <laughs> collapse on that. And let's suppose it's, a, it's the 115 gigahertz uh, wavelength photon for a carbon monoxide molecule. It mm -hmm. collapses in a way from all different directions that all of a sudden gives it this tremendous increase in rotational speed compared to the momentum that it transfers, uh, it, the linear momentum that it transferred. So, so mm -hmm. this, this tipped wavefront shouldn't be thought of, imagine that we reverse the direction of these waves and we start heading them back. When they mm -hmm. start getting closer here, finally they deposit it into the center here and they mm. now deposited their h bar worth of angular momentum because they had this uh, archimedean spiral yeah and they deposit it to the left of the proton on that picture because that's where it came out of whereas mm. other other if you picked another point on the circle it would be coming from a different angle yeah so yes you're... yes so yes every every point it, it, this one yeah, is this also one, no, perpendicular yeah. so this yeah. is so they're all coming in and trying to make this spin up faster. It lost yeah. it, it, it lost angular momentum when it emitted the photon, but if it, it absorbs the photon in this way, it then is going to gain it back again. Good, thanks. So the wave-based model explains photon wave properties. Uh, numerous experiments have pro proven that photon emission takes time. I won't go into this, but this is a, an important point. You don't, people, the simplistic version of quantum mechanics is, oh yeah, you have these discontinuous jumps. No, 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 real emission takes time. And uh, there again was another website that had a nice animation of this that uh, showed exactly how they, it happened. But anyway, there's no instantaneous uh, transitions between atomic orbitals, for example, the rubidium D2 transition emits a photon over 26 nanoseconds. And this is about 10 to the seventh oscillations or 10 to the seventh wavelengths. I'm gonna use this now as an example. So you have the ra radius of the rubidium atom is this number of 10 to the minus 10 meters approximately. The wavelength is this, 
So it turns out that the wavelength is about 3,000 times bigger than the radius. So you can't emit a, a single point of light in a specific direction if you have the wavelength vastly bigger than the emission. You know, this is the fraction limit gone wild. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, it must emit spherical waves, um, not a narrow beam. Now I'm going to quant uh, qualify this thing when I say spherical waves because there's one direction it has no amplitude. Um, so, so uh, oops, I went backwards. I mean, so, yes, straight up and straight down has no amplitude, and everywhere else has some amplitude. That's a guess. <laughs> no, um, no. So okay. anyway. Let's imagine that this point right here is the rubidium atom in an excited state. And it is about ready to emit a photon. The rubidium atom is, um, how many times did I say? 3,000 times smaller than the wavelength of the, uh, the wavelength of the photon that it's going to emit. So an important part here is that when it emits this um, photon, it, the atom itself gets a recoil velocity of six millimeters per second. So it turns out that if you say, okay, we're going to look at the De Broglie uh, wave characteristics of the whole atom, it turns out, you know, that you get, if you, you can get a diffraction pattern, uh, for example, a neutron going through a double slit gives you you know, double slit patterns, and even Buckminster Fullerene, you know, C60 is a molecule that has still has these uh, De Broglie wave characteristics. So I'm saying one of the conditions for achieving a stable atom, stable molecule, whatever, is that all of these wave properties have to add up so that externally you then get these De Broglie wave characteristics. So it the atom, as it recedes at this velocity, is carrying is got a De Broglie wavelength the same as the photon De Broglie, the photon wavelength, and so initially there's a symmetry. In other words, the photon wavelength is emitting its energy into this distribution. Namely, there is an expectation direction. But the waves are actually going off in other directions also, except for the wave amplitude is zero in the backward direction. But that's exactly the direction that the rubidium atom is carrying away momentum. And it is carrying, if we drew the characteristics of the rubidium atom, we'd find out that, hey, we fill in this and we make a circle again. That's just for an instant. But so the point is that you have uh, that an important part of all of this is that when the wave is emitted, it is not initially emitted into a very narrow angle. Now, this isn't to say that you can interact with all parts of this wave, because what it turns out that is the rubidium atom is going backwards. And imagine you could capture that and tell what direction it, wh where it started and what direction. Well, the further away it gets from the, the starting point, the narrower the uncertainty angle is for the momentum that this uh, rubidium atom is carrying. And similarly, the photon that is leaving has got a momentum uncertainty angle, exaggerated here. But in other words, you can't, ex uh, once you start to get away from the emission a little bit, you can't interact with something over here, even though there's waves there those waves are going to be able to collapse, but they have to collapse symmetrically so that we don't impart any angular momentum that we shouldn't have imparted. So we can only inter interact with this photon over the uncertainty angle here. And uh, this, this uh, pattern, by the way, is this is the equation for it. So in that last diagram, were you saying basically yes. the wave when the photon is emitted by this particle, it the waves go in all of these directions, not in the apart from the direction that it's it's recoiling. Yes. And then 
the only place that can absorb that energy is not directly at the up arrow it's in a small angle at the top momentum yes. uncertainty so, angle. so so the small angle gets smaller and smaller as time as it gets as the time after how much emission in other words imagine you were tracking the rubidium atom mm. as it recedes mm -hmm. and you had an uncertainty where it was located and you have an uncertainty once you measure where it is but mm. between the two of these, you say, oh, yeah, now I can tell the vector within a certain resolution. Yeah. So that same resolution applies to where, when, the, when these waves collapse, there's only an angle that, that will accept, that, that will achieve this symmetrical um, collapse. So, uh, but these other waves, by the way, you know, a light beam carries gra makes gravity. Everybody uh, they just forget about it. Oh yeah, yeah, I guess it does. Must have some mm -hmm. gravity, but they don't even try and say how does the wave make gravity. Well, it turns out that these waves out here, uh, they their electric fields have kind of canceled, but their second order effect, the gravitational field, hasn't canceled, and the wave, the gravity of the wave is is being imparted out here also. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So. Oh, by the way, there is another point here that I want to make, which is that you here I have a draw a dotted line for what mm. I'm saying, the forward hemisphere, and then the backward hemisphere, these waves here. By the way, another thing to notice, the distance between the length of all of these arrows is the same. In other words, we have a distance from the center to here, and that's one distance. But all these other arrows, if I take this arrow here, that is exactly the same length as this. That's just another property of this equation. So um, anyway, by the way, this enters into a whole lot of things having to do with um, the, uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll go to, I'll get into that later. Thanks. I want to, I want to uh, then now talk about something. Uh, there was a, a graph that was in a physics book I saw in college that always bothered me. And in other words, let's suppose that we have a plane wave of light that hits an absorbing surface. And the, there's a hole in this surface. And the surface has a certain diameter that's a certain number of wavelengths. So we have the intensity of the light, is, I'm going to call it I sub zero, that hits this. And now we're not going to look at the diffraction pattern that's produced out here. That's that's. I'm going to look at the intensity along this center line here. I'm imagine, and you can actually do this experiment with microwaves, where they put the microwave detector and measure the intensity of the microwaves right along the center line, and you get a graph like so. For if this diameter is two wavelengths. Then you get this graph. Now it turns out that this zero line is exactly the center here, but before the light gets to this, this absorbing surface, it's already showing a wave, oscillate, a wave fluctuation or the amplitude fluctuation. And I'm sitting there as a student saying, "Why? how can this be? How does it know it's coming? to this to this surface it's an absorbing surface you know nothing's being reflected well it turns out that once you go back to this and look at this backward portion of these waves that's what ends up giving you this interference and the interference is different depending on whether the diameter is three waves here we have a different pattern than if it's two waves and also there is an amplitude change as you go here by the way is the line for what the amplitude was at the, the for one so anyway this was just one more confirmation about the wave properties really really telling you what's going on and all this photons so now we're going to talk about a photon model of entanglement and i'm going to use an electron positron annihilation um and i'm also going to say it has opposite spin and it generates two entangled photons. And the reason I choose this is that I find that it is very important to pay attention to what to the recoil of the atom or the molecule, or whatever it is, that makes a photon. So the only example I can give that has no recoil 
is this uh, electron positron ion annihilation. There's nothing left to carry away momentum or something like this. So then I'm saying that if we have this uh, and we initially had the annihilation handling uh, happening here. Now, this is a cross section of spherical waves that are propagating out, but these are two photons and rather than having a, anyway, and they're, they're, these combined properties can be any polarization, any spin direction and any momentum vector. In other words, the two of them are going to be the two of them, if you took the polarization, they're going to cancel the spin or the momentum vector. But in this form, so these two annihilation waves are going out and they don't have any properties at all. And they're expanding at the speed of light. And I said, let's let them go for a light year. And now we're going to um, have them, one of them be absorbed. So here, here is my here was the original uh, location that we launched this from the annihilation. Here is an absorbing uh, particle that is now taken away some of the energy of this what was originally uniform. So now I've colored this. So here is fully black, and here it's absolute white. And when you get back to this. Uh, uh, Kirchhoff obliquated, I can't even say the word. Um, this pattern here, essentially what I'm drawing is, is this, where now I've, in the maximum intensity, I've colored black, and the, 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 so it's zero here, and it's maximum here. So it now explains how we get this mystery of, you know, how does this, uh, the, the, the remaining photon have all of the opposite properties of the that the, the absorbing photon. Well, it's real simple. It just we just removed it. all these waves collapsed into this that we're going to go into this one photon, and now what's remaining is the residual that has the opposite polarization, the opposite spin, and the opposite momentum. So when I originally drew this. Uh, years ago, I assumed that I said, oh, it must be that you can collapse at faster than the speed of light if you go around this longitudinal direction. I'm saying now that I've thought about this for more time, I've kind of abandoned that idea. And I've been forced into, let me just say, as I look at other experiments, you have the uh, you know, in a double slit experiments, you can have experiments where you have what they call delayed decision, where people, be, after the light has gone through the slits, you do something to one path or the other that is then trying to figure out if the photon really knew, uh, really went down both, both, paths, both paths. And um, you can never see anything that implies that the photon didn't already know what you were going to do. Now, the interesting thing, I'm going to, I'm going to actually just tell you what all this says. A photon has got no, it, it doesn't have any time and it doesn't have any distance measurement. In other words, it's going at the speed of light. So it doesn't, time doesn't pass. The speed of the distance that it went through doesn't pass. So as far as we're concerned, we're looking at the photon using our perspective of the rate of time. And the photon is saying, no, no, I don't go by those rules. So in my, <laughs> I've reluctantly come to the decision that as we look at that, what, what happened, it is as if the photon can go backwards in time and decide what path it had to take in order to achieve its goals. So then, uh, this is this is something that you know it, it, you can never get any violation of the uh, causality because this is within a single quantized unit photon. You can't communicate anything and so forth. It just that it infuriates the experimenters that they can't figure out how the photons did all this. So um, so uh, I'm gonna. Uh, 
sorry, what was that last slide? Okay, that each, okay. Each okay. Post -protein is carrying so this is, I, this gets back to this other point that I was mentioning. I've already kind of covered this, which is that a linearly polarized photon um, carries a specific uh, angular momentum. I was, I was, I, I went through this point where you, you know, the, yeah. Okay. So, um, so how big is the distributed volume of a photon? Well, certainly, you know, people have when they're dealing with point particles, and then they have to somehow have pilot waves and that sort of thing, and then they can't figure out what happens in a double slit experiment and everything like that, and. So I'm, I'm going to say, OK, uh, photons from a distant star brought to a diffraction-limited focus spot by the 6.6-meter .6 diameter mirror of a James Webb telescope. So this means that light from this, this distant star would form a double slit uh, a diffraction pattern, even if the slits were separated by 6.5 meters. If you look at what really is required in order to get a diffraction-limited spot, you have to have you know, essentially the same wave is uh, distributed uh, coherent over the whole area. And not only that, if you take a laser and you diverge the laser beam in a spherical wavefront, this can spread over a 30 degree angle and it can go out for a light year. It has got an enormous width. Now, suppose that we have there are some lasers that can be made to have a very stable bandwidth down to one hertz. So that means that we have a train of waves in this photon that extends over a distance of three times 10 to the eighth meters. So imagine now I'm now describing a photon that was emitted from a stable laser and went out for a, a year so this photon is now distributed over roughly a light year in diameter and a light year in length. And it is this enormous volume that it is distributed over. And yet, when it is absorbed, there is, you now have the properties of entanglement when that those waves are called in. In other words, those waves can propagate or can return because of quantized angular momentum at faster than the speed of light and deposit all their angular momentum in an absorbing medium. In fact, imagine that um, you have a black surface that, and we had the wave, the bandwidth of the laser was one hertz, but the absorbing medium absorbs photons in less than a nanosecond. Well, it turns out those waves then had to collapse down and all get get absorbed into a single atom in that absorbing medium in a very short period of time. And but the phot the photon has no time dependent, no time uh, terms. So it can do all that sort of thing. So anyway, that that's one of the properties of the photon. The uh, I guess this I've said already said all that. The polarization uh, and now we're going to get to polarizers. The polarization of a photon also collapses when it encounters a polarizer. Um, a polarized a photon must deposit angular momentum in a polarizer if there is a change in the polarization. I'm going to skip ahead and tell you about uh, my when I was working in the aerospace industry. Uh, one of my inventions. I actually got a patent on this and I got a government contract on this, <clears throat> was to study the possibility of, um, it had to do with laser radar systems, but we wanted to change the frequency of uh, a laser beam. We're using it for a local, uh, anyway, using it in a laser radar system as a local oscillator. Um, and imagine you have a circularly polarized beam of light. And if we pass it through a half wave plate, the half wave plate reverses, changes it from say clockwise circular polarization to counterclockwise circular polarization. But now if you rotate that circular, that half wave plate, you actually begin to change the frequency of the light that is coming out the other side. And each complete rotation makes two rotations 
of the it increases the frequency by two rotations for the circular polarization. If you put linearly polarized light into that half wave plate, you know, if it's station, if the half wave plate is stationary, the linearly polarized light then comes out at some new polarization, depending on the orientation. But if you now start rotating that linear uh, that half wave plate, you end up splitting the linearly polarized frequency into two counter rotating circularly polarized beams. So you end up with a rotating linearly polarized beam, but that is made up of two counter rotating circularly polarized beams. So the reason that I'm getting into this is that I'm trying to get to the idea that putting something into a polar, even a polarizer, a linear polarizer will do the same thing. If I rotate a linear polarizer, I then make uh, new frequencies coming out. So, <clears throat> so then what I'm saying is a photon must deposit angular momentum in a polarizer if there is a change of polarization. <clears throat> so there is no one change, in, change in the bandwidth if the photon, uh, of the photon when it changes polarization. Therefore, the time required for this polarization change depends on the bandwidth of the photon. Anyway, <clears throat> this last point goes on to what I've already said. So um, I'm, now, I'm now finished, but I don't think I've necessarily covered all the questions about polarization. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the most important part that I'm, try, that I'm trying to get a hold of here is to relay the, I, let me try and stop this so you can then get the, okay, now I'm back. <laughs> so, the most right. important thing is that um, we think of the quantized angular momentum as being the key to uh, understanding the way a photon interacts with an atom or a polarizer or so, something like this. And the ability of this quantized angular momentum to be able to collapse all of the waves and make it into something that in experiments looks like it's a particle, you know, wave particle duality. We can never see both the wave properties and the particle properties, but it turns out that the wave properties are the real photon and the quantized angular momentum is the excitation that gives it the particle-like properties. Okay. Any okay. questions? <laughs> Um, I have a few comments. I have to go in a minute because I'm actually yes. at work and I'm kind of cheap working here. Okay. <laughs> but um, anyways, I think that you and I are very much on the same page. So you're basically preaching to the choir here. So just uh, that's great. Um, just a few little tiny things like I um, in the work that I do, I try to work in um, cycles rather than radians. So yeah. one of the challenges, I'm going to challenge myself to rewrite all of your stuff in terms of cycles. And so not angular momentum, but um, you yeah, know, so that yeah. everything is one, because that, make, that makes quantization a little more palatable in that one complete cycle is one quantization. So when you do stuff in radians, I mean, radian is not a complete cycle. One radian is not a complete cycle. So it's only a partial cycle. And so I'm in, you know, like the numerology works out the same, the numbers work out the same, everything's fine. It's just a matter of interpretation. So, right? so the reason, the reason that uh, since H bar is usually used rather than yeah. H, I use H. So, okay, I use H so, and I use cycle and I have a symbol. I invented my own symbol for cycles in the unit section. Okay. So, in, in the standard hmm. uh, language, you know, it's one over S for uh, frequency and I use um, a symbol. I have a triangle that I use like Delta change. I, so in the unit section, so uh, frequency has units cycles per second, not one over S. So I specifically, and that actually changes the language quite a bit and clarifies a lot of things. So in a lot of the, the papers that I've been working on, independent papers, I, I use that symbol and that, um, makes it things very clear. So one cycle is one circle. And if angular momentum is quantized by cycle, that makes sense. Radians yeah. doesn't, uh, radians doesn't make sense to me in terms of a radian is just the radius distance 
around a circle. It's a partial distance around the circle, not one complete cycle. When, so that's when, when I get to uh, the electron model and the uh, forces and all that sort of thing. I actually, I guess I, I have always known that I could also have used just the, the complete cycle, but somehow yeah. I, I worked with the radians. Everyone uses radians. It's easier okay. to compare your results to the, the mainstream when you use radians. Okay, thank they you. Do, right? But um, you can also get the same results if you switch. You just multiply all your equations by two pi over two pi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. And then you, you're converting to um, to a cycle sure, instead of Sure, sure, sure. So By the way, if, any, if, if, if either of you have any thoughts about any collaboration, I'm, I'm up for it. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, and uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the alpha. So yes. uh, Planck's uh, the fine structure constant and the anomalous magnetic moment, blah, blah, blah. So, um, Planck, so the alpha is equal to, Planck, I think, E squared over Planck charge squared or the other way around. So I found that really interesting. So Planck charge to me seems like it's the charge in the vacuum and E, the charge of the electron is the charge in the particle. And so alpha mm -hmm. is um, the yes. charge, you know, electron charge squared over Planck charge squared. And I think that that's a really interesting clue as to why we need, you need to throw, you know, 137 or, you know, it's By the here. way, uh, th in, in my electron model, it turns out that the electron model says when I have this uh, distortion of space and Planck length distortion, if you just radiated that, you would have the properties of Planck charge rather than charge E. Yeah. But it turns out that that then is carrying away all of the electron's energy in, in a time 10 to the minus 20th seconds or something like this. So you then end up with the, for an electron or for any uh, fermion to be stable, it has to have some way, uh, it has to find a resonance that mm -hmm. offsets that. So it turns out then uh, that the uh, reducing that emission to by alpha or by a square root of alpha, because yeah. So then the uh, then that's a stabilizing factor. But the interesting thing is, you know, I'm so far in the papers that I've written, I, or in the book, I talk about the strong force besides the electrostatic and the gravitational and so forth. But it turns out that the I get the strong force also. But inside the electron, there is the residual of the strong force. In other words, yep. imagine I that I am going to collide uh, two electrons and uh, at a high speed. So then I'm going to plot out the fourth, the, the repulsion that I get. Okay, so as we get closer, we are getting the electrostatic repulsion. But at, at the point where those two electron models have now gotten to be um, two Compton uh, half, uh, angular wavelengths apart, now we have gotten down to what I'm calling the core. So we change from where we have waves that have the alpha, the square root of alpha involved in it, to suddenly the internal waves that are making this. And suddenly the repulsion should increase from the charge E repulsion calculation to the Planck charge repulsion. The interesting thing is that I'm saying that when I collide two of these electrons, they, um, when I'm measuring the size of an electron, and I imagine I'm going to click, connect, uh, cl uh, charge, collide, I can't come up with the word, collide a proton and electron. The electron appears to be smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters, but what people have forgotten is that that is the size of the electron when it has undergone this collision of you know over 200 giga electron volts. Well, when you add in, when you change the energy of the electron momentarily, you know, rather than roughly half a giga electron volt up to two, uh, over half a mega electron volt to 200 giga, it reduces to 10 to the minus 18. 
Hmm. So in the so the equation that says what how much force has to be exerted in order to be to keep that working that you you're storing all the energy then that turns out to be the same force that that is if you were bringing two plank charges together. So anyway, the strong force is actually the electron. Everybody says, oh, the electron doesn't feel the strong force. But really, there is a residual part of that that does feel the strong force. Right. Yep. I think, uh, okay, so just one more thing. I think you should really look closely at Jeff Yee's work because I think you guys are really uh, saying the same thing. You're basically, he basically, you know, has reproduced what you've reproduced. And so between the two of you, you might be able to, to really do something wonderful. So in terms of a collaboration, I would say, and I did, I co-authored a couple of papers with Jeff. And so we're, we've been working together. So yeah, I, 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 I haven't had time to look at some of those. So, and I, had yeah. other things I mean, to... he came to the same conclusion that Coulomb is a length and that he modeled it as a length and that made a lot of things come, you know, uh, clear to him and was able to move forward with his model uh, once he made that realization. So that's a really brilliant uh, that you uh, came up to the same conclusion. So that's so, uh, very interesting. So when I when I applied that deal about the length, it works out for a lot of things, but it doesn't work out for everything. And I decided that the problem was that there's a difference between, you know, in an equation that has units of length yeah. in the, in the, in the uh, units. Sometimes your radial length is what you're talking about, and other times you're yeah. what I'm calling ruler length that is not, yeah. not directional. So yeah, you might want to have a different symbol for that then, and not yeah, cancel, yeah. not cancel, because yeah, exactly. I think Jeff actually he does cancel the units, and I think maybe we shouldn't. Yeah, that's so maybe we should yeah, have a different well, symbol for that length. Yeah. So I can tell you which ones work and which ones don't, because you end up with. Uh, it's, if he just has a vague idea of length and I come up with, no, no, it's exactly, I can tell you exactly what the length is. And I do go through in, in my book, I go through all sorts of examples of, you know, some calculations. I don't, yeah. uh, there's others that I've done that I didn't put in there. Yeah. And the other thing that I say, that's very, that you said, that's very similar to what I say. Um, so I wrote a paper called Planck's Constant and the Nature of Light. And that's where I introduced this symbol, this Delta symbol. Yeah. And uh, in this paper, I come, I come to the conclusion, I say that every oscillation of light, I don't call it a photon, but every wavelength of light carries the same energy, right? And you're saying that every wavelength of light has the same amplitude, and that's kind of like saying the same thing. So it's, it's very similar because yeah. energy and, and amplitude yeah, yeah. are kind of correlated. And so... so uh... So, uh, you know, uh, as you're talking about the every wavelength, uh, so I'm yeah. talking about wavelength in, in the equation as opposed yeah, yeah, to yeah. distributed. It, no, over exactly. A exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about as yes. well. The wavelengths yes. in the equation. And um, yeah, and so I changed my language a little bit to talking about wave fronts instead of wavelengths because I think that every wave front has the same amplitude. Every wave front carries the same energy because really when you think of a wave crashing on the shore it's the wave front that pushes the rocks you know away from the shore yeah, and yeah, so yeah. i think if we call them wave fronts instead of wave lengths and the wave length is just the different distance between wave fronts and so you know a lot of the problem i i have a thing i say you know the problems with the language the physics is fine the math is fine the problem is with the language and interpretation of the equations and so that's where I'm trying to kind of maybe rewrite the language a little bit to be to, uh, a little more um, realistic. It's so the fact that you call them acoustic waves is lovely. I work in the field of, I work in medical imaging and I work in ultrasound is my area of expertise. So acoustic waves are near and dear to my heart. And so when you, I'm not offended at all by you calling them acoustic waves. I yeah, think that's I'm calling. I, I modify it, calling them quantum mechanical acoustic waves. To quantum mechanical acoustic waves. That's fine. I'm happy with that. But anyway, I, so I am sorry, sorry, but I have to go. Yeah, you guys yeah. can keep uh, talking. But thank you yeah. uh, so much for inviting me to this conversation. Great. And I will, if you don't mind, John, I wouldn't mind sending you a couple emails. Maybe we can have a discussion. So you got uh, my offline. email address, right? I think yeah. I, your email you is do, yeah. in the uh, yeah. list. Okay. And so if that's okay with you, I. John Maybe give you a link to, you know, we can talk about how to convert back to uh, H instead of H bar. <laughs> yeah.
Oh, yeah. Okay. John said about putting this video on his website. Um, well, are you okay with that? Or? So, yeah. Okay, I got to go. Bye. Okay, see you later. So one one question for you. I realized mm -hmm. as I was uh, giving this, uh, I had to uh, when I shrunk my shrunk the number of participants. Oh yeah. My my face was never on the screen that I'm recording here. Oh, okay. So what you're recording had me, and what I was recording had you. Oh, so okay. um, I can send you. Some, what I've got somehow, uh, yeah. Whether uh, you, whether it's on a flash drive or are you going, uh, putting it on, um, what's the word? Anyway, some of these things that will handle with enormous file sizes. Yeah. Um, so I'd okay. like to get your version. So I can okay. Then... Yeah, I'll send it over. Um, when the the original thing for doing this meeting was to do with the um, quantum key distribution to understand whether we could uh, intercept yeah. a quantum key distribution. So I don't know whether the, in terms of like I, your, I your went, theory, yeah. So yeah, I, I you know, I, I, there's a couple things that I don't understand about this. I looked at the videos and I read a little bit. And um, so the idea that you have to be working with single photons Mm, and you don't do, yeah. really know, you know, if it, it, you know that you have. Anyway, I, I had trouble mm -hmm. kind of like uh, if somebody is intercepting something, yeah. they um, you never get the on your you, you have a B at the center, the interceptor mm. and the. And if they've taken that photon, yeah, you don't get it, and you don't even know no. whether they've sent it or not. So anyway, I found it kind of hard to imagine how it could ever work. Yeah, well, it, it works if no one intercepts it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, uh, you know, but that's the. I think the point of it is to make it so that the person on the two people on each end can be sure if they follow this protocol that no one has intercepted it. And by the laws of quantum mechanics, if someone intercepts it, they'll be able to work it out. See, and that's that's the idea behind it. But the thing I'm interested in from you is, given what you know, these laws of quantum mechanics maybe don't apply. And in that case, if I was clever enough and I knew what you knew, <laughs> I could be the interceptor and go, oh, well, waves actually act like this and I do, you know, or energy, I can absorb some energy, copy the photo, you know, there's this yeah. no cloning theorem says you can't copy photons. So if, if you agree with that. No, if, if you, you can't, you're going to get, the moment hmm. you do anything to the photon, you hmm. get all, and you, if you can detect it, you yeah. have collected all of the all of the photo all of the waves all of the angular momentum yeah and uh so uh, it's all or nothing is what it amounts to so you do fully believe in the collapse of oh, the photons I, energy and yeah, it's a single and thing and in fact not thing. only that I, the amazing thing that i'm saying i just fully realized had to do with that deal about the carbon mm. monoxide molecule when the collapse is happening it is making a much bigger physical effect on the rotation velocity than mm. the translational impact from just absorbing a photon. So this collapse is, it, it's impossible to come up with. I'm, there's no particle explanation of how you can get this increase in angular rotation of velocity um, using, using the particle models. Yeah. I've been trying to look at Jeff's stuff and your stuff and thinking about whether there could be an even simpler and less fantastical thing going on. So obviously a collapse of a wave function, you, you mentioned the light year thing. So you've got a photon traveling out for a light year. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. gets there and it gets it covers a whole space, yeah, like, yeah, a, a light yeah. year wide. And if you had all these, um, whatever they call carbon atoms spread over this yeah, yeah. one light year thing, lots of them all like covering yeah. the plane. And this photon could arrive at, well, it does arrive everywhere, kind Every, of. And it begins and, to be absorbed at a lot of different places and it gets recalled. So, yeah, in so fact, yeah. 
yeah, then the idea is that the way the theory goes is that across this big sort of semi-spherical area, only one of those out of that entire light year's worth of thing gets absorbs that energy and none of the others will. Fine, fine but, no, but so I, at one photon. In, in my in my model, all sorts of them can begin to absorb it. Okay. And, and only then one of them is more well suited you know, having to do with spin directions and all that mm. sort of thing yeah. is more well suited. And mm -hmm. it just, it, once it starts to hog the angular momentum, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, everything that went on with the other carbon atoms gets canceled. Yes, yes. And it goes backwards in time. <laughs> and really? it just, it says, okay, those never happen. And it just all happens at once. All the energy goes into that one. And it's, imagine that I'm saying, I have a, an intuitive prejudice. Mm. I can't imagine anything going backwards in time. Mm. But the photon, it, it took, it's taken me years to finally say, okay, am I, I mm -hmm. have to stop being prejudiced and look at it from the photon standpoint. And mm. it didn't do anything wrong. It didn't have any time. It doesn't know the difference between, you know, like past and present. So it didn't know that it did it. All it just says is I have to deposit all my energy in one place and, and it, 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 it's a now, <laughs> it just happens. There's no time yeah. between emission and absorption either. I've heard a theory that I don't know if it could be completely non-usable as, a, as a, a way of interpreting what could be happening, but that across this one light year space with all your your atoms they are they all are all they're, they're rotating at the frequency you're talking about the low frequency and you, you know you make sure they're all rotating at that frequency but the theory is that there is something different about them like a loading theory it's called so maybe like what's rotating is slightly different across all of them so they've all absorbed they have a certain amount of energy but you the frequency is the same because it's got to match the frequencies you've talked about. And then you, you start your emission. And when you emit, whatever is emitting this light energy, if you keep it, the simplest model I can think of is that that thing is just emitting waves and they're just very simple waves. And then they're going at the frequency that, you know, whatever you describe, it's emitting the frequency. All these waves just going, um, they're polarized, they have angular momentum, all those things. And they all that that wave spreads out spherically. So say you're you're taking positrons and electrons in one point in space and just making loads and loads of waves by just annihilating them one after the other. All those waves carry on going out in a big sphere. And when they hit your barrier here, all that happens is all the time those waves are arriving at that, that barrier, those little carbon atoms are increasing the amount of energy they have absorbed now i'm picturing that as the the what's being rotated the, the radius of it is getting slightly bigger whatever the rotation is but the, the the frequency stays the same but at some point and they're all doing this at a different rates because they all have different starting points when you start the experiment because you can't carbon atom has they're different yeah that's the theory so they all have a certain load and then at one point one of them the first one will hit the point where it's got so big it's absorbed it's kind of getting wobbly and but it's still it has to stay at the frequency you're talking about and then it's like okay now i've absorbed all this energy and it goes and starts going at the next energy uh, the next frequency level and i don't know maybe at the at the switch point it may emit its own waves which can be detected that's could be i don't know if that happens in the model but this way of viewing it doesn't involve any kind of you know fantastical collapse of something across a light year it doesn't involve anything any lot faster than light um effects that involve that is involved in the way you're talking about it and it doesn't involve going back in time it doesn't involve all the things you've talked about that you sort of said you've had to force yourself to accept. Um, so that's 
one way I can think of it, but I'm sh I'd just like to know why that has to be rubbish. Why why it so, can't be that the simple uh, the simple way of the loading theory basically. So I, 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 I there are examples of experiments mm -hmm. which involve splitting uh, what you might say a single photon, giving it two paths to follow. And then you try to determine which path. Anyway, you're trying to essentially see um, it going down both paths or you're trying to, anyway, it mm -hmm. always it always acts like it knew what you were going to do ahead of time. <laughs> and it decides, so it turns out that um, I'd have to look at some of these experiments to be able to I answer. I think you may be describing the Zach Freud of inframasal experiment where it, it bounces, it, it gets split at a mirror and goes two yeah. paths and then detects. Yeah, yeah. But, but that you can also just um, interpret just by saying that the waves go down both paths. Yeah. And then this effect that I'm talking about, the loading effect, happens at the point where they interfere. And you know, you've said like they do the experiment so that they emit the light and then they change the polarization of the thing after it's left, so or after it's gone through it or something. And then they say, Oh, well, um, we changed it after it had left, so it couldn't have, you know, made up these things. But if you view the whole thing as just a continuous stream of waves and the thing at the end is just something that builds up energy and then go you know detects a photon photon you know and it's not really a there isn't if you think there isn't such a thing as a photon there's just a, what light waves waves in space that gradually create an effect that leads to a you know a molecule switching up a um a level or a detector suddenly emitting a pulse then all these ideas and things about you know st changing stuff after you've changed to um sent out the pho photon it will become explainable because it's just waves going through stuff so if you change the thing at one point it will be fine so i i don't know if i'm really following you but i'm now visualizing let's suppose that i send out i'm going to now use a carbon monoxide gas distributed mm -hmm. in space so you have all these gas molecules that everywhere. Can, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> zillions of molecules. And we now yep. send one photon into that swarm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are going to start absorbing that. You know, and I have a, this this uh, wave that's a second long that is going to get in there. So a lot of them have started to mm -hmm. uh, interact with that. And yet yeah. somehow only one of them ends up with it. And it, we had to do something. And, you know, it probably, one way of thinking of it is if it's a second long, maybe after a half a second, uh, it finally has made up its mind which one is going to end up with. And therefore it recalls the interactions that happened in around the, mm. in the other carbon monoxide molecules and plus collects all the waves that haven't achieved, haven't gotten to that region yet, for the other half second worth of waves. Mm. So um, anyway, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> and uh, I'm saying it's reluctant, but it it makes sense if you look at it from the, from the photon standpoint. And all the experiments that people do, all they they never can get, never can solve this problem. And I'm finally saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to say this is a prejudice that I have that I'm trying to live. I'm in living in a different universe than the photon is. Yeah, fair enough. Do you accept the collapse? Yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Cool. Oh, thanks. That's interesting. So basically, the original question about um, could you sort of collect a bit of the photon's energy or not that's gone you know you that, can't tell you can't absorb whether it's polarized or yes not. yes so i'm saying that the same way that i'm saying that even if you collect a little bit if it turned out that you didn't collect all of it you get none of it, it you know you, yeah. you, you, it gets and, reversed out of yeah, you're yeah, collecting yeah, it. yeah 
put it this way, it, what I'm saying might be wrong, but the conclusion is right, which is that you don't get the, the you, it, this, this idea of quantized angular momentum being the key to understanding everything. You know, yeah. in fact, even the, even the, the word quanti, quantum kind of implies a discontinuous jump and, um, you know, a quantum leap or something yeah. like that. So, uh, and, and I'm saying that it, it's, it kind of creates a wrong impression because when you're dealing with waves that are, um, can, you know, that take time to be emitted and take time to be absorbed and, mm. and, uh, I think in. I can see that being quantized in that when the, whatever emits a, a photon, you, I can see that as being a quantization as that only ever happens when that thing that's doing whatever it does, spinning, um, switches. That's how you emit photons, isn't it? You have something that switches from one frequency to another and loses energy. That's, that's how you generate light, isn't it? And, or any electromagnetic well, wave, you, you have something going like that, and then suddenly it goes slower or faster or whatever. And, and in that transition, there's a wave that goes out and that's called so, the photon. So let me, uh, so the electron model that I have, you know, where I have these standing waves out there, so let's suppose that we grab a hold of the, I'm going to try and get my hand into the video. Here. <laughs> we're going to take, and we're going to take this a little electron and we're going to start shaking it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now what happens is that there, and if I shake it at a high enough frequency, there's returning waves that are coming and they end up miss, you know, by the time they get back, they end up missing the photon, uh, the mm -hmm. electron model. They don't get, you know, they had to reenact, re, uh, react and, and uh, with the rotating core. So then you say, oh, gee, there, if I'm shaking it at a certain frequency, there is a certain distance beyond this distance. All the waves that were beyond that took too long to come back and they, and they missed. So what happens to that? Well, gee, that turns out to be the photon that it's going to absorb, that it missed. And mm -hmm. it took energy for you to shake that. And it turns out that the energy that is that didn't get back, if you say how much energy was out there, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that what I'm explaining, I, I don't remember if we're, if what I'm say, explaining is off by a factor of the square root of alpha or not. But mm -hmm. you, you know, it just takes a little longer to, for this to happen if, if it's off that by that much. But anyway, you end up essentially abandoning energy in that cloud that surrounds the core, and that abandoned energy turns out to be the photon. Ah, uh, okay. But photons are emitted generally, like if you start turn on a light bulb, there's the particles in the light bulb, the electricity flow is causing electrons that are orbiting particles to switch from higher orbits to lower orbits. And then when they lose energy from going a higher orbit to a lower orbit, the frequency of the electron we're assuming is changing frequency from one resonant frequency to another. And in that sw sudden switch, that is an emission of waves. Is that what a photon is so in the light bulb? So I think that, it, put it this way, what I'm going to tell you is mm. subject to some controversy or some discussion, okay. but just accelerating a charge or accelerating an electron mm. will generate photons. Okay. And so uh, the, the, just, the electrons moving through the wire. Just oh, through, through the light bulb, not, not even, that. no, no, no. I'm just talking about if I could somehow, I have an electron in space. Hmm. If I can accelerate that, or os really, I have to try and oscillate because Oscillated, whatever yeah. whatever I'm trying to do to accelerate it is hmm. implying a new electric field and all that sort of thing. Okay. So if I can somehow oscillate that electron, mm -hmm. I then end up gen I can generate a new photon at that oscillation frequency, okay. and uh, 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 put it this way: it, it's not just 
there's various ampl there's there has to be a certain amplitude there that is you know there's a frequency and then there's an amplitude yeah. and once i get the oscillation up to an amplitude that relates to the rate of the, the time that that takes then i have hit the condition that can create an elect a uh, photon a photon okay so the, the electrons in my lamp up there they're flowing through the filament and in the process of flowing through they're they're resonating at some whatever frequency and amplitude and the ones that are hitting clank amplitude for a certain amount of time are emitting individual photons of energy which yeah so what i what i'm saying right now i really mm -hmm. haven't analyzed and said oh yes i can tell you exactly what the size of works yeah. and yeah so it, this is a little bit on the fringe of <laughs> I, this is what i think but i haven't really analyzed this part yeah well I, i'm kind of imagining that that lamp up there is doing that and but it's for me i don't think it's sending out individual photons i just think all those electrons are resonating at whatever the right resonance and then all there's a continuous stream of waves coming towards my eye and inside my eye um there's molecules and they're absorbing energy and and absorbing energy the electrons are absorbing energy um and then when they hit a certain amount of absorption because they're resonating with the right frequency being emitted they are switching uh, orbital so and then when they switch orbital that creates a current and the current is what flows through to my brain and detect and tells me oh the red uh, detector in your eye at this point over here just absorbed enough energy to switch uh, rotation that means there's a bit of red and it's over there and then the green one does the same and then the other one does the same and all three of them do it at the same time and that tells my brain there's white light out there so you know i worked I with laser I think it's I, continuous <laughs> i worked with laser radar mm. and um so in fact it, it, it i won't go into the details of it, it, anyway the point that i was going to make is that um you're talking it, you can hear the pitter patter of individual photons arriving. Mm -hmm. There yeah. is, if you say, okay, I have a beam of laser light that is a certain wattage, mm -hmm. then you say, how many photons per second are arriving? Yeah. And then you say, okay, there is a randomness to this, and we should hear a certain amount of noise on mm -hmm. this. And if you want to get rid of some noise, you crank up the intensity. Uh, the number of photons per second that is coming yeah. and it will be less noisy or you you, yeah. you actually get more noise but more signal and mm -hmm. the signal that so anyway it's even even in a beam of light you still are getting evidence that it is made up of discrete photons that are there mm. but it is uh again even though i'm saying photons all of a sudden people are visualizing little points or particle no 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 when it arrives at the detector you get these pitter patter of collapsing <laughs> photons yeah. arriving there. Yeah, I haven't really heard anything that says that it couldn't be possible that your your detector is receiving a continuous stream or pulses as as things um, emit, and at some point the elements in your thing detect uh, reach a certain threshold and then say oh something happens and you go oh i've detected a single photon but really all that's happened is the thing that causes the detection of a single photon has happened in your detector that's not the same as you, you know that's not the same as saying there was a thing that went through space called a photon they're, they're, i think that's a bit of confusion possibly there okay well anyway um still quantized because you, you you're right there's a quantization in emission emission only happens at a certain point and then in one 
flood and then absorption is quantized because the frequency switch of a carbon atom happens in lumps it doesn't you don't get half an absorption or half an absor you absorb a certain amount of the the energy switch of the atom is quantized so you can't that's that's the the lumpiness of everything i think but what's actually causing that switch i think there may be a possibility i'm yet to be convinced that that can't be happening that there is a, a, a continuous a more a more continuous flow of waves and energy that is causing this quantization but i think that's for another day when we've got more energy and we haven't been going two hours okay but yeah i really enjoyed your talk thanks a lot for thank that. you so yeah i uh i don't know how i can get what you recorded but mm -hmm. because it's i'll send it in a big file thing. Pretty big file, one way or the other. So yeah, it's going to be huge. Perhaps it's a flash drive in the mail. But uh, what is it? They have the um, Dropbox that I think that they have a maximum file size, but hypothetically you could split it if it's too much. It's probably going to be 300 gigs or something like that. <laughs> 300 gigs, wow. Mm. Had another one that was like 150 and it was an hour. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know if it's going to be. I don't think it'd be much. that big. But anyway, I don't know. Um, I can send it via Google Drive. Or wait a minute, maybe it, maybe it, no, maybe I'm thinking it was uh, not 300. Three, no, not, no, 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 no. A movie, yeah, yeah, 300 meg because a yeah, movie is a movie is like two gigs. And uh, this is probably going to be about one or two gigs. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye. Speak soon. Bye.